So good afternoon from London, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ivanka Barzashka and I'm the Managing Director of the King's Wargaming Network. So thank you for joining us uh, today for the launch of our new public lecture series on advancing wargaming as an academic discipline. And I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Ellie Bartels, who's joining us live from Washington, D.C. Uh, today. Um, and I'm also pleased to see that our events continue to attract uh, such a significant interest outside of King's. Uh, we have um, viewers from uh, the latest statistics were 37 countries across six continents um, who are joining via Zoom and, and YouTube. Um, this, is, this is truly impressive, so, so thank you. Um, and interestingly, uh, we have in our audience today um, as many academics as government viewers. And you may be wondering why epistemology is, is such a hot topic in government circles. Uh, but this interest isn't surprising uh, because policymakers are increasingly worried about what can we know and how can we know in an uncertain and dangerous world. Um, it's also not surprising because uh, almost exactly two years ago, we established the Wargaming Network at King's uh, as a reflection of intellectual humility at a strategic inflection point. Um, and in recognition that we need better tools for understanding the changed and changing strategic environment. Um, and, and that this strategic inflection point um, created, has created a policy need for innovation um, which has brought wargaming into the limelight. And so we at King's have brought into the limelight the discussion about adapting wargaming uh, to meet these, the, the new analytical needs uh, for this changed environment. Uh, before that, um, wargaming had been practiced more as an art than a science and, and by a small community of, of experts, mostly in classified military environments. Um, and the value of wargaming is uh, a rigorous academic method uh, uh, that was um, largely contested. So I'm, I'm really pleased to see how far we have come um, as an intellectual community. Um, and in acknowledgement of, of this progress um, and the future needs, uh, we at King's have developed a new wargaming research and education strategy. Um, so it's focused on the development of wargaming as an academic discipline, and it's built on three pillars. Um, now, the first is that we're continuing to expand and build capacity uh, we now have two permanent faculty members at the Department of War Studies um, that are focused on wargaming. Uh, Dr. David Banks, who you see on the screen, uh, he has just joined us as a lecturer in, in, in war studies and, and wargaming. Um, and I think, um, uh, David, you're, you're the first person that, uh, the first academic um, um, in a, at a civilian university that actually has wargaming as, as part of their title. Um, so, um, David is, uh, serves as, as our new academic director uh, for the Wargaming Network. Um, and, and many of you know Dr. Aggie Hurst. Uh, she's been promoted to senior lecturer um, as a result uh, of her contributions to Wargaming Scholarship. Now, second, we're um, redesigning and expanding uh, the Wargaming curriculum. Um, and third, we are developing a new research program around two components. Um, so the two components are fundamental research and applied research in wargaming. Um, so the applied research captures the use of wargaming uh, methods to uh, develop and test scholarly theories and, and answer policy questions. Um, but the, the fundamental research, um, you know, this is this is the um, uh, this focuses on questions on epistemology and methodology. So today uh, we're launching a new lecture series on developing wargaming as an academic discipline, uh, in part as, as part of this effort to advance fundamental research in wargaming. Um, so our, our intellectual community has come a long way in the two years and, and these lectures um, will be featuring breakthrough scholarship on wargaming that advances wargaming theory and, and, and applications. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ellie Bartel, 
Bart Bartels is our first speaker. Uh, she's the co-director of the RAND Center for Gaming. Uh, she's also an associate policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, where she specializes in national security policy analysis uh, and, and gaming. And her other research uh, work focuses on defense planning, force development, uh, measures short of armed conflict, including both long-term competition, uh, gray zone hybrid warfare, and, and irregular warfare. So uh, a very impressive uh, portfolio. And I should say, I'm particularly delighted to welcome Ellie today because as many of you know, I have been uh, calling for analytical wargaming to become more scientific. And scientific means wargaming needs to be systematic, public, and, and rooted in, in producing uh, worldly knowledge. And this is essential if wargaming is to um, inform national security and defense policy. So Ellie has, has heeded this call and produced what um, I believe today is, is, is the most comprehensive account of epistemology for policy gaming as part of her PhD dissertation at RAND. And, and so please join me in, in welcoming um, her to Kings virtually. Over to you, Ellie. Thanks so much, both to you and to the rest of the, the team at Kings. It's been really amazing watching how the network has built over time and seeing the work that you all have done um, to, to sort of further this. Um, I'm just pulling up my slides now. So give me just one moment. All right. Hopefully that's all sharing for folks. Um, great, well, you know, I, the work I'm presenting today is, as Ivanka mentioned, a piece of the broader set of research I did for the dissertation. Um, you know, while the title sort of harkens to the sort of highfalutin term of epistemology, what I'm going to try to do in this talk is really try to ground that very concretely in, you know, what, what does this term actually mean and why does it matter, both from an academic perspective, but also from a policymaker perspective, um, where I spend a lot of my time. And I think really the point here is, as Ivanka has sort of alluded to, how do we know whether games are telling us something useful and helpful, not just as the, the game designer, not just as a participant in the room, um, but as someone who wants to come in after the fact and consume the findings of games? How do I know when a game is reputable? How do I know um, what context I can apply the, the learning that I've had from a game? Um, and when do I need to maybe be a little bit more skeptical of what's going on? All right, so. You know, the, the bottom line up front here, um, the, the argument I want to make today is that when we're doing games for research, um, we need to make sure that we're aligned with a, a scientific logic. And there's more than one scientific logic available to us. Um, there's different ways of thinking about how to, to work that in. Um, so I don't think that this is a, a thing that's a rigid constraint on us. But I do think in order to be credible, we need to have a logic that ties from an understanding of what types of information we're going to produce um, and why the game we've designed is capable of producing that type of information. And that when we can be systematic and grounded in this type of logic, it's going to be easier for us to be credible um, with ourselves, with our peers, and with the consumers of the information that we're generating in games. So most of what I'm going to cover today is what I think some of these logics are. Um, and then how, how we can actually think about starting to apply them into our game design choices to try to make this a little bit more applied and a little bit less um, sort of esoteric in its tone. All right, so first, very quickly, um, just to kind of establish what, what I'm referring to when I say game or war game, I'm going to tend to default to using game rather than war game just because I find that term to be a little bit more broad and inclusive. Um, but I think of games as being a, a collection of tools that situate between um, three other methods that are perhaps better known um, to folks and so I think make for useful reference points. So on one hand, we can think about comparing games to modes of expert elicitation, whether that be interviews and focus groups and workshops. Um, and we can think about the, the sort of key difference here being that, that while both are interested in um, the expertise of, of humans, right, we're talking to actual people, um, where in a game, we're interested in um, placing people into a specific context and having them make decisions, we might not be doing that in expert elicitation to the same degree. Um, so there's, there's sort of a, 
what I think of as being kind of a fuzzy line um, between when we we have a workshop where we're asking people for their opinions and perspectives in sort of a more abstract way um, versus when um, we have a game and we're asking people to make concrete choices and look at the consequences of them. You know, if we move down to the bottom corner, we can think about the difference between games and models. Um, so often people will talk about games as being a type of model. I'll explain a little bit later why I don't tend to like to do that. Um, but what we can think about the difference here being both of these are interested in thinking about um, systems and how they interact and connect to one another. Um, so within a gaming context, we can think about having that um, synthetic environment um, that allows experiences to be projected. Um, you know, in the case of a formal model, that's when um, we have that same type of formalism, that same um, concrete relationship between different aspects of a system, but where a game has, puts a lot of focus on the role of actual humans interacting in that system, um, a pure modeling and simulation is, is only formalism and doesn't have the, the player in the loop. Again, this is a blurry line, right? It's totally coherent to talk about human in the loop simulations. Um, which are which are sort of right on that median line. And then a third category of activities that I think relate to games and, and in fact, frequently um, the terminology gets mixed up between the two of them are military exercises, right? So if we think about a game where we're asking actual humans to make decisions in an artificial environment, um, we can contrast that with an exercise of, of various types where you have actual humans, but they're in their real environment, whether that be um, that they're sitting in their command post working with the systems that they'll actually use um, to run command and control during um, an actual military event, or you have folks out in the field, um, you know, practicing operations, right? And so there's a, there's a degree of sort of um, simplification and artificiality that comes into a game um, that then becomes more concrete when you get into an exercise. I think one thing that's useful about situating games as being the, the nexus of these three sets of tools is you get a sense for the diversity of games, right? You can have games that very much look like a workshop. You have people sitting around the table, um, you know, talking to each other, maybe referencing some read ahead documents and looking at some slides, but very much something that feels more in that kind of workshop space. You have games that feel very much like a modeling and simulation, whether that be um, a computerized system or a manual, we can think of a class kind of hex encounter board game. Um, and then we can think about games that start to feel very much like an exercise. So for example, where we're bringing the actual staff of a particular command um, to walk through key concerns, but we're, we're taking them out of their day-to-day um, -day environment and putting them in, in this more artificial environment of the game. And I think that, that starts to get at something that I think is important, which is that when we talk about games, it's important to recognize that we're not talking a monolithic entity. There's a lot of diversity that falls under this umbrella um, in terms of what the finished product looks like, but also the types of tools and how we're using them. And so I think one of the things games have struggled with is grappling with that diversity and still having some overarching rules of the road that make sense, but that don't force us into um, what Peter Perla famously refers to as sort of the cookie cutter game solution, right? You don't want to be in a position where there's only one right way that a game can look and a game can be, and because that really restricts what's a lot of the richness of the toolkit that we have available to us. So I just wanted to start out by sort of framing that I am talking about games in this very broad sense of the term. I should also mention, I'm going to be tending to talk about games in defense context, but almost everything I say applies into other types of gaming. So for example, you know, I think Kings was really commendable in putting forward work on um, what we know about pandemics from games, right? So thinking about that broader aperture, and that's part of why you'll tend to hear me say, hear me say game rather than just war game, is to make it clear that I am talking about that broader suite of problems. All right, so you know, having situated sort of what I'm thinking of when I'm talking about a game, I want to make a distinction here between sort of two broad purposes that we tend to be working with um, when we're thinking about games. And so the first is games for discovery, research, and analysis. And these are games, in my mind, that the primary goal of them is to generate information. And that contrasts with games for education, training, and communication, where you're mostly interested in conveying information. Um, you know, there's lots of different frameworks out there that sort of use slightly different terminology and divide these up slightly differently. But I think the really important part here is, is the relationship to the information. 
is the primary thing you're doing with this game that you have developed an understanding of our problem and you're trying to teach somebody else, you're trying to communicate it to someone else. Um, and therefore you're building an environment that immerses the person in a problem. Um, you have the roles that are intended to help people understand institutional equities and sort of internalize how different um, individuals or entities within a system are operating. And then rules that are really intended to be instructive, right? They're, they're helping you understand how the system works. Um, what's your range of possible actions? How do they interact with each other, right? But fundamentally, this, this is a tool for pushing information out. Um, you as the game designer are communicating to the players through the mechanism of the game. In contrast, when we're thinking about games that are really intended as part of a research process, the game itself is really the thing that is generating information, right? So you as the game designer have built a construct where you're going to bring participants into it and you're going to learn from whatever the results of the game are. And as we'll get to later, there are sort of different types of information that we might be trying to generate and different ways we might be trying to generate it. But the core idea here is that we're using the game very much as, as a tool for, for data collection or elicitation. Um, and so, you know, the environments tend to be um, putting people in circumstances that we're not going to be able to explore directly. We can't collect real world data in a lot of the issues we're interested in in security spaces. Thankfully, we don't have that much evidence of what uh, fighting a, a major conventional war looks like uh, in the 21st century. Um, we don't have a lot of understanding of how the nitty gritty decisions might happen um, if we have AI on the battlefield because these things haven't come to pass. Um, we're using roles to bring experts, um, participants in and help us understand how they think about the problem, right? Um, so it, it's rather than being me as game designer to talk to you as participant, I'm learning from the participant, right? It, it, the, the information flow is much more inverted. And again, when we're thinking about rules, you know, it's really the process of you as a game designer trying to sketch out what you think some of um, the ways causality works, um, but you need to have the flexibility and, and the sort of expansiveness to understand um, that you're, you're still building up that understanding. You're still working to, to figure out how the system works um, and then to try to, to understand how decisions end up working in that system as a result. Um, and so that really puts us in a different mindset. Um, I'm going to be talking about today games that are really in this discovery, research, and analysis. That's not to say I don't think games for education are important, and that's actually where I started my career. Um, but I think the, the clarity of dividing and saying, you know, hey, when we're, we're thinking about issues of epistemology, when we're thinking about how do we know whether the information we're generating is um, an actual sort of justified belief versus whether it's just a, an opinion, um, I think that has a very different valence when we're thinking about teaching, where we're, we've basically decided that we think something is justified and that's why we're teaching it to someone, versus research and discovery, where we need to actually be evaluating whether the information we're producing um, is that, that sort of justified belief or whether um, we might not be producing information that's maybe not as well founded. All right, so a couple of words on um, some of the common shortcomings of games for research. And, and this is, I think, important in the, our story because it gets to the question of why do we even care about this, right? Epistemology sounds like something that should only be of interest to, in the academy at some level, right? And most of us go through the day perfectly fine without sort of interrogating the philosophy that's undergirding our every decision. Um, so, so why are we why are we worried about this? And I think it's because it really can impact the quality of the the findings that we have for games when we don't have that epistemological framework, right? So, what we see right now some real common complaints that we'll hear um, when we're using games for policies um, when we're in that sort of initial scoping phase. Well, there's a frequent concern that games are being asked to do too much. Um, that you have a game that's sort of trying to answer too many questions that maybe don't align well with one another and so does none of them very well. Um, that the research question is unclear um, or what's actually a helpful standard of evidence isn't actually very clear from the get-go. Um, you get um, sort of research questions that are framed too broadly, um, too abstractly to really understand how am I going to produce information that's actually gonna be helpful in moving the ball. Um, or we just get questions where um, it's a perfectly valid research question, um, 
but there's other analytic tools that are more appropriate than a game is. Um, and what we're seeing sometimes is that, you know, people want a game because they saw one that worked really well in their previous job or because they're trendy and they want to, to try to um, capture some of that energy. And, you know, th those are all laudable things that games do, but it's important to be careful that we're saying, okay, you know, is, is this actually the right tool to be using for our research? Um, and without having sort of an understanding of how the game's generating that information, it becomes hard to, to make those choices, right? How do I know when, when one more objective is too many? How do I know when a research question is focused enough? How do I know when there's another tool that might be more appropriate than a game? Um, and so you're, you're trying to ground us a little bit more firmly in what, what the sort of logic and the science is can help us do those scoping tasks a little bit more cleanly, I believe. And hopefully I'll persuade you over the course of this talk. Second, we can think about design, right? Um, you know, here I think there's a, a concern first that, um, you know, the, the team that's doing the game design um, sort of pre-commits itself to a, to a particular method or an approach. Um, and as they do the research that you do as part of game design, as you build your own understanding before you start bringing in participants, um, you your understanding of the policy problem evolves. And sometimes it evolves in ways that um, you don't expect and, and that maybe make some of the earlier decisions you made um, invalid. And so how do you know when you need to reassess your fundamental game design choices or even decide that a game wasn't the right choice? Um, and then additionally, how do you make sure that the design that you're, you're executing is actually one that's going to produce the type of information needed um, and produce it in a way that's going to be credible to the audiences you're interested in, right? Um, I think most designers, and I know I've certainly had this experience, have built a game that we thought we were really proud of, um, we thought produced some interesting insights, um, and you get to the end of the process and you find out that while you thought it was compelling, you know, the folks you were trying to reach with the game, whether that be um, a more academic audience or whether that be a policy making audience, don't find the results to be as credible or they're, they're just sort of not framed in a way that's usable by the organization, right? And so thinking about that, again, going back to that question of what's the logic that's underpinning it helps us think in advance about what types of evidence are going to need to be um, produced to be credible um, and how that, that sort of logical consistency draws up from the foundations of the game. And then finally, you know, when we think about socializing the results after the game, um, you know, as I said, there's always this concern that um, games sometimes exist in a vacuum. We run a game, but then it doesn't lead to anything. Um, this has been talked a lot about in the last year or two. Um, John Compton had a really excellent piece on War on the Rocks that was sort of raising this concern um, that games are, are sort of separate from the rest of the analytic enterprise within the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, and there were a number of rejoinders, including um, by Peter and some of the other folks on the call today, that were really pointing out, you know, this is where the cycle of research comes into play. You need to connect your game to other types of research and analysis um, and pointing to some historical examples of that. But it's not clear from the get-go, how do you do that? How do you make those connections in a sound way? And so again, I think going back to what's the foundations becomes, becomes sort of a missing link here. Um, you know, again, again, going to the credibility point, uh, being able to document your, your game in a way where the logic of it is sort of clear to the reader, I think becomes also important. And then finally, um, one problem that I see both within the game design community and externally is this question of, are we assessing games based on the right standards and what standards are appropriate? And I think one thing that I've tended to see looking back through um, the theoretical research that exists today, people tend to, to talk from their own methodological training from the past, but they're often talking past each other. Um, one of the great things about gaming is that it's often a very practitioner um, oriented discipline and we're very inherently interdisciplinary, right? Um, you know, if you look at what people's degrees are in among top gamers, you get everything from physicists and chemists to political scientists and sociologists, right? But that means we have different vocabularies and different standards. And I worry that we tend to talk past each other um, when we try to have these conversations because we assume that we all have the same foundations and we actually don't do the work to kind of cross time. 
So, you know, we see these sort of three big batches of, of um, problems that I think do meaningfully erode the ability of games to contribute um, to, to the research enterprise, um, both in the academy and within the policy spaces. All right, so what do I, what do I think we need to do um, in order to resolve this? And so I'm gonna go back to the first lecture um, that was held here at King's when you guys first launched the Wargaming Network. And you asked Peter Perla, um, is gaming an art or a science? And he said, well, it's both. And we need to, we need to think about it uh, in both ways. And on one hand, I absolutely agree with Peter. Um, I, you know, I wanna make sure that I, I'm making it clear that I don't think that treating games as an art is invalid. However, when we're talking about games for research in which we need to have um, a tie to some logic that makes the results credible, I think it becomes very hard when we're missing the science half of the equation. And I think the science has largely been neglected. You know, if you, if you look, um, whether you look kind of historically about the way games have been written about, I don't think it's an accident that the book most cited is the art of war gaming rather than the science of war gaming. Um, and you also see sort of a general skepticism about the scientific frame from a lot of gamers. Um, and so, for example, I've done some work surveying gamers and asking them about how, sort of how they talk about um, standards of good game design. And one thing you see is a lot of artistic language. You talk about player engagement and enjoyment um, rather than talking about sort of the credibility of findings or the logic that underpins them. And so, you know, I'm going to be arguing that we should be taking more of a scientific approach. And that's really because I want to, to sort of make up for that historical gap um, in the literature rather than necessarily fundamentally disagreeing with Peter that, that yes, we need to keep our eye on both. And to that end, I just do want to put in just a couple of, of sort of examples of what the case for, for treating games as an art are. Um, you know, uh, Peter and, and McGrady's piece um, on why wargaming works talks about games as a story living experience. And I think that phrase has captured a lot of folks' imagination because it does um, really sort of capture some of the essence of what being in a game room feels like, where you have that collaborative narrative discussion coming forward. Um, I also really would recommend Ed's recent piece in War on the Rocks from last year, um, where he talks about getting the story right on gaming. He talks about what types of stories um, games tell. And so thinking about games as a way of exploring what's possible, unexpected, what works and what fails, um, I think, again, is, is a really, um, it feels like a compelling way to think about it because it, it matches with a lot of our experiences. And we can also think about some of the, the more academic work that's been done, thinking about games um, as sort of spaces of play. Um, and so thinking about games as a, even a ritual space that allows types of activities and experiences that you can't have um, within sort of your traditional button down day job where you're open to exploration and to experiences. I think these are all absolutely true. Games do all of these things. Here's the problem. When we talk about art, we are fundamentally talking about something that is at a pretty fundamental level subjective, right? There is, I think we've all had the experience of going to a museum and there's some of the art that really resonates with it, art, us and there's some of the art where we're like, I don't know what the curator was thinking on this one, right? Um, and if you, you've ever had the experience of going with a friend and realizing you have completely different taste in art, you know that you can have really subjective responses and experiences. On one hand, I think that, that adds a lot of richness and complexity and it's worth grappling with. But when we're talking about games as a tool for research, that subjectivity pr provides a really unstable foundation, right? Because it doesn't allow us to ask questions about how, um, you know, if I'm a player, how did my experience in the game translate to other people's experiences in the game? Um, so is what I got out of the game the same thing as the person sitting two chairs down from me? Um, how do I apply what I learned into the game to another context? So, you know, I participated in a game on humanitarian assistance disaster relief. Um, does what I learned translate into thinking about responding to a pandemic? I don't know, I don't have a good framework for helping me think about that. More fundamentally, what makes for a good game? How do I know that um, what, what I'm experiencing either um, in the room or um, you know, after the fact, if I'm reading the report, 
how do I know that the, that the information and the results of the game are credible? You know, if, if games are an artistic enterprise that are fundamentally judged by your experience, um, there's not much in the way of a grounds for judgment because it is all personalized in a really fundamental way. And so without dismissing the value of that experience, and I think particularly when we're talking about educational games, you know, there's a lot of work to be done grappling with that seriously. When we're thinking about games for research, you know, I think we've got to have something more foundational to come back to that lets us make a case for why those experiences are matter for decision makers, for um, our knowledge about the world. You know, so how do, how do we go beyond just experience and have that foundation underneath us? Not surprisingly, given how I've been talking so far, I really think a lot of this comes down to being more scientific in our approach. I think it's important here to maybe talk a little bit about what type of science I mean, right? So, um, you know, historically, defense has really um, generated, it has tended to, to focus on science as a singular, a rigid, and a quantitative endeavor. In fact, I think in a lot of ways, really what it has been is an engineering issue rather than um, necessarily a scientific issue. And so, you know, I think we need to expand beyond that kind of very narrow definition of science and think about um, where we can be doing a little bit more um, richer and broader sense of what science is. And so, you know, we, if we go back and we look at, um, you know, the literature that's been done on philosophy of science, what is a science? How do we know what we're doing science? How is science actually practice it? Um, you know, I think what we see is that there's actually a lot of diversity in what science is and how it's practiced. And sort of the version of science that we all learned in grade school, you know, I'm going to have a hypothesis that plants like light and I'm going to put my seeds in the two baggies and I'm going to put one in the light and one in the dark and see which grows. Uh, you know, those types of common experiences we all have with science are actually fairly, you know, are very limited picture of what um, professional scientists do and how the practice actually works. And what's more, I think we also tend to focus on the hard sciences as being where we should look to for what a model of good science is. Um, Right, so going back to our definition of games, um, if games are fundamentally a human-centric endeavor, um, it would make sense that we would look for a science that puts humans at the center of it, right? And so I think that leads us to look not to the physics and the chemistry and the biology necessarily, but to look more at the social sciences, um, to think about the ways that um, anthropology and psychology and political science and economics have conceptualized what science looks like and how do we practice it. And so I'm, I'm sort of gonna take that turn of saying, what, what has the social science conceptualized as science? And, and do we see evidence for game designers working in those types of modes um, and thinking in those types of ways? The reason I think that that's helpful um, is that, right, if the game is generating information in a way that's consistent with one of these logics that are articulated by a version of science, um, I think that helps with the credibility, right? You can explain uh, the game generated this information, this is how it generated it, and this is how the way that it generated it is consistent with standard forms of, of science that are um, credited and taken seriously in other areas of the academy. Conversely, how do we know when a game is bad, when it deviates away from that logic, when you lose the ability to, to tie that connective tissue together. And so I think that starts to put that foundation that, that was sort of missing on, from the artistic view underneath game design. All right, so, um, you know, Far, I'm not, I'm not going to try to say that there is any one set of philosophies of science. This is a really rich and diverse literature. Um, but one way of looking at this that I found really compelling comes out of international relations. And so Patrick Thaddeus Jackson has a 2010 work um, uh, that was looking at philosophy of science um, from the perspective of international relations. And, and it was trying to figure out sort of what are the types of, of science we might see and how it, might we operate. I think what's incredibly important about this work is that it says that there's more than one way to do science and it puts it into a vocabulary where you can understand what the trade-offs and differences between them are. And so rather than, than just sort of asserting there's one science and it looks like this, it recognizes that there's more than one way to do this 
um, and that they're, they're going to have different standards and different logics and that each can be internally valid. Um, we just need to be clear about where we're sitting. And so I think there are three that are particularly important for us to be thinking about um, for research game design. So the first um, is positivism. So this is what most of us think of as kind of the standard scientific approach. We're going to engage in direct observation. So I, um, as a researcher, I have the ability to kind of stand outside the world and observe what's going on um, objectively. Um, and then, but we can do that both by, through direct observation, meaning literally my eyes watching it, but we can also use a whole host of other measurement tools to do that. And that we're, by being able to see um, the, that process unfold of how inputs and outputs interact with each other, I'm able to establish causal relationships, right? If I have more of X, I get more of Y, that kind of thing, right? And the goal here is really to come up with those generalized truths or rules, right? I want to have a law that I can move around. Now, I very rarely get to that point, right? More often than not, I'm still wor working in the world of theories, but that's really where the end state is. I'm trying to discover an objective truth that can be applied within sort of a defined range of context. You know, the, this is really the methodology that we're used to from empirical work, whether that be things like comparative case studies, um, but also when we think about um, the emerging role of lab experimentation, um, particularly in fields like behavioral psychology, as really sitting in this kind of space. But that's not the only way of doing science, um, is one of Jackson's key points. And so two other ones that I want to mention. So the first is critical realism. So critical realism um, makes the move of saying, actually, a lot of what we're interested in in the world, we can't observe directly. We can't see racism. We can't see uh, society. But these are, are important constructs. Um, and we see the ways that those shape the world around them in a myriad of different ways. And so rather than directly observing the relationship that we're interested in, what we actually do is that we see patterns of behavior and use those to tell us about, to develop a theory about a complicated causal mechanism that's actually driving that behavior. But that, that actual causal mechanism is fundamentally unobservable. Importantly here, this is not going to be something that generates generalizable truth, right? Because we're not directly observing um, that, that construct, that causal mechanism. We're developing a theory about it and then we can gain more evidence about how we think that that construct works what we think it is but at the end of the day it's still it's an abstract construct that we're putting in you know here the logic is almost of a, a sort of jury trial murder case right we don't actually see the murder get committed but we see lots and lots of evidence and eventually we decide that the reason there's not much reasonable doubt about what happened. We have a pretty good sense of what happened because there's just so much surrounding evidence that lets us see it. But we're never entirely sure, right? And you know, the standard is not that, that it is true. The standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. And so here, I think we can think about it in sort of that same kind of trajectory, right? We're interested in building up the evidence around it so we're more and more confident, but we never get to perfect knowledge. We often see these types of approaches um, in historical case studies where we do really deep dives of a particular thing, or in ethnography where we have someone um, go out, do field work, and really immerse themselves in their surrounding. And they're trying to get at the, these big conceptual ideas with enough richness so that you can make that surrounding evidence um, to be as clear and as, as compelling as possible. A third model, analyticism. Um, so these, these are the model builders of the world. Um, so from a philosophical perspective, these folks make a different turn from positivism and say, what's this idea that we can stand objectively outside the world? We are all, we are all part of the world that we live in, and we're all fumbling around seeing the little pieces of it that we do and trying to make sense of it. And so rather than pretending that we can generate some sort of um, abstract objective outside of view, um, you know, we're, we're really living in the world of subjective sense making, right? We're trying to, we're trying to tell ourselves a story, um, a, a simple problem, uh, you know, a statement that helps us understand um, a particular set of contexts. And so here the goal really changes from being about something being true to something being useful, right? Uh, my, the mental model I have of how my town works is 
objectively not true, right? I've simplified a ton of things. I've highlighted some things. I've, I've ignored other things. I'm aware of things that are very important to other people, but it's useful and that it helps me get around to the day. And it helps me communicate with somebody else. I can tell them, hey, here's a set of directions for how to, to, how to think about navigating town. Here's what their different neighborhoods are. Uh, here's how I conceptualize space, right? That's useful to telling my friend what parts of town they might want to see. Um, but it's not true in any sort of external sense of the term, right? Um, and so here, we tend to be thinking in terms of other approaches. This is something we see a lot in formal modeling and in expert judgment where really what we're trying to do is understand how somebody makes sense of the world and in a way that's useful for a particular purpose, right? And so given different purposes, I might develop two very different models um, that are, are equally credible. They're just intended to do different things. Um, and so that's, that's a very different standard for what types of evidence are and how do I know what's true and what's useful and what standards I'm trying to gain versus the critical realism where right, you know, I, I'm not ever able to, to prove things to truth. Rather, I'm trying to say, hey, what's the preponderance of the evidence versus positivism where I am trying to general, uh, get, get that generalized um, rule going. All right, so that's all a little abstract. And so what I wanna do now is sort of drill into each of them from the lens specifically of gaming and say, um, what does game design look like when we think in this way? actually going to start with analyticism because I think this is really how most game designers tend to work, right? Um, so this is, is sort of the classic way of thinking about games. Games are a type of model. They're a model that involves humans. Um, and we're going to run a game that's intended to be useful for gaining an understanding of a particular problem. And so really my goal here is um, that I'm going to try to understand, get an understanding and appreciation of how I think a system works, both from my own experience of, of moving through the world, but I'm also gonna talk to lots of other people about their sense making, and I'm trying to incorporate that into my own model to have something um, that's sort of as useful to as many people as possible. And so the key task from a game designer is really to distill the key aspects of a problem in a way that represents reality to, to the degree needed to be useful, right? And so as I move through the game design process, I'm going to, to find out the different, different aspects of a policy system. And I'm going to decide, yeah, I don't think that's that critical for the question I'm asking. I'm going to really simplify that. Oh, no, this is really important. And so I need to make sure I'm representing that really well, right? I think for those of you who have done game design, this may start to feel really familiar, the way you tend to, to think about um, that initial set of decisions that you make when you do game design, where you're, you're sort of feeling the elephant and trying to put the pieces together in a way that's useful. I think the important caveat then becomes that what this game is going to generate is a useful understanding, um, but it's one that's very self-contained to the actual game and the purpose that you ran the game for. If you've built a model of um, you know, pandemic response that's really looking at sort of, well, what would happen in this particular set of, of activities based on the, the experience and sense making of these particular actors, you could turn around and go to a different set of stakeholders and end up with a very different understanding. And the, your original understanding wouldn't be more or less true than your, the second understanding. They're just different because of the different contexts and the different actors. And so you're really using the information in a different way um, than some of those other frames that we talked about. And, you know, and I think really how I tend to think about these games from a research perspective is that these are games that help us organize our thinking about our problem. They help us make sense of the complexity. Um, it makes them incredibly valuable when we're starting out a line of research and we're trying to sort of get our hands around a big complicated problem. Um, they can also be really valuable in trying to understand you know, what are, what are the main debates? What are the questions that are still unanswered? Because we see them come out in different people's sense making, right? They'll emphasize different points um, compared to one another because of the differences in their own understanding and context. Right, so when we think about building games this way, right, we're really interested in bringing in that group of participants as well as the, the members of the design team to try to engage in that collective sense making. And so, you know, I think of these games as, as really being a balance between providing enough structure that you can direct 
you can make sure you're focusing the conversation on the right problem for the right purpose. Because remember, we want to be useful for a particular purpose. And if we're not sort of really honing in on that, we might end up sort of off the mark because we're being useful to some other problem. But at the same time, we need to have enough openness in the game system that we can, we can learn and experience and incorporate other people's understanding. Um, so we have the space to engage in that, that sort of uh, narrative processes of sense making. And so I think we tend to think about designing environments that are really intended to focus player attention. So these are games where I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the scenario um, because that's really what's going to, to do the work of capturing the player attention and drilling down on what that, that particular area of focus is. Um, we tend to play, spend a lot of attention, not just to who the right actors to represent in the game are, but who the players that we're actually going to bring in are. And I think that's because so much of what we're doing when we're sense making is talking to, is, is the narrative work of understanding, you know, what's the story you tell as an expert in this area? What's the story he tells as an expert is this area? How do I understand that with my, within my own process? And then when we're designing rules for these games, I think we're really focused on making sure that there's the space for unexpected and new things to come in, right? The whole point of having um, these, these sort of actors with rich experience is that we're, we're still trying to incorporate new parts of, of the problem and really understand them from different perspectives. And so you need to make sure that the rules are sort of open and flexible enough um, that you have the ability to do that. And I think that this, model that I've just talked out is actually the way I would say probably the majority of game designers think about their work, right? Um, they think about trying to build an experience where game, you know, a range of participants can come in, can pool their expertise, can collectively come to an understanding that's better than what any of them had, um, and that will be helpful in answering specific types of questions and generating useful information. The point here that I want to foot stomp, and I'll reiterate it again, I don't think that this is a foreign imposition on how game designers work. I think a lot of us work this way today. We just don't articulate the logic using that, the concept of, hey, I'm working in an analyticist mode, um, and it's because I believe that, you know, we're, we, I don't believe in mind-body dualism, right? We don't use that vocabulary, but we do have those sort of precepts and priors embedded in our logic. But not all of us work this way all the time. And so I want to walk through the other two major schools because I do think there are substantial and important groups um, that work in, in a different frame than this dominant analyticist mode. So the, the first um, is the critical realist mode. Um, here, I think this is when we, we start talking about games that are intended to generate um, innovative ideas or theories of success. I think this is really what we're talking about, right? We want to use the, a game as a forum for hypothesis generation, right? Um, so going back to that initial definition I gave you where I said, you know, we're looking for evidence around a big idea we can't see. The theory of success, the idea about how we are going to be um, able to engage in a positive way in the policy environment, it, I think often is that sort of big unobservable um, that we're looking for evidence around. And so, you know, really here, these are games that we're trying to develop a plausible new idea about the types of causal mechanisms that interact to produce an outcome, right? So we're not saying if I have shiny new tank A, I'm going to win. What we're actually saying is if you have this tank and you employ it in this way and the adversary responds with this set of assets using this set of concepts on this type of terrain, will get a positive outcome, right? It's that whole nexus of different factors interacting together that become important rather than just sort of a one-to-one -one relationship. And so when we're in this mode, we're running games that are about um, a, a specific system. Um, and here I mean in the sense of like a policy system, not in a technical system, um, in which different actor strategies can play out over time in that particular context. So we can see how all of these different pieces might interact with each other and try to gather evidence from, from what we can observe about the, the sort of potential uh, theory of victory, which isn't directly observable itself. Um, again, these results are only going to be theories. And so, you know, we can't really credibly extend them without resort, without turning to other tools for research, right? Um, so th this is where, you know, there's a lot of emphasis in the gaming literature that games don't prove anything. I think it's folks working in this critical realist mode that are really the ones emphasizing that. They're saying, hey, look, 
all I can do here is show you that the preponderance of the evidence in this game leaned in this direction. But we want to bring in other types of evidence to try to bolster it because I can't directly observe um, the main causal relationship I'm interested in here. But I think these are still incredibly valuable games, right? They help us see potential new ways of operating. They help us get some best guesses, right? You know, if we're standing from the outside and saying, what are all the ways we might possibly use a new system? That becomes really overwhelming. If I narrow it down and say, okay, hey, you know, there's these three promising ideas that we think are sort of plausible um, approaches, that becomes much more tractable to bringing in other forms of analysis that might be more expensive in terms of time and resources um, that might simply just be very difficult to execute. Um, and so that work of sort of necking down to some interesting use cases, I think is really valuable. Um, and, and it's a mode we work in fairly frequently, right? You know, here, I think the design really becomes about generate that, that sort of, how do we design a game that sparks new ideas, right? And there's a whole literature on games for innovation that I think by and large are very much in this critical realist mode, right? We're interested in things like how do we um, make sure that we've articulated the environment in a way that imposes real world constraints. I think we see this all the time in technology games. Like it's really great that your uh, missile that completely defies the laws of physics is excellent in combat. Unfortunately, since it defies the laws of physics, it's not actually going to be very helpful to me in the real world. So, you know, making sure that we're bringing in those real world constraints so that we are getting actually plausible outcomes is really helpful. But we also want to have um, actors that have tensions between them so that you have this sort of iterative process of stress testing um, that they go through. Um, and that you need to have some space for creative thinking, right? If you perfectly mirror the way the world works now um, and try to, to come up with an innovative new idea, you haven't left people very much space to, to actually experiment and to try out new things, right? Basically, you're not allowing that big new idea to emerge. And so thinking about when do we need to, to be sort of um, imposing real world constraints to make sure that we're not in, the, in sort of the space of science fiction, um, but making sure that we're not confining ourselves to the way things are done today in a way that really cuts off the potential um, to have these these plausible new ideas come forward, I think becomes a lot of the work of, of the game designs in this mode. Again, I think we all know people who work in this way. I think in particular, when we talk about, uh, you know, as I said, innovation, uh, you know, concepts and technology gaming in general, I think often do tend to fit in this. So I would identify this as sort of a secondary mode um, that's very frequently still found in the policy spaces. All right, third, positivism. Now, I think this is the one that um, the sort of traditional view of gaming treats um, most problematically because this is really treating games as something of an experiment or a quasi-experiment, right? I'm going to, to take a small number of factors. I'm going to intentionally vary whether they're present or absent in my game, and I'm going to see how it impacts the, the outcomes of interest, right? In effect, it's an experiment. Now, I think the, the point a lot of folks have, have emphasized is that there are limitations because of the artificiality of the built environment of the game and because you've got groups of players who are interacting with each other that introduces a lot of variation. I think what this misses is that this is all true in other types of experimental literature as well, right? The sort of ideal perfectly controlled experiment is, is not actually the way most science works because um, you know, you're, if you're doing experimentation in a lab, you're in a, a rigid artificial environment that doesn't have a lot of the real world dynamics. You, you've sort of simplified the problem set. Um, if you're looking at real world historical events, then you do have a lot of uncontrolled variation. And so there's actually quite a lot of literature out there in the positivist frame about how do you, how do you think about these problems given how do you make these comparisons in ways that are justified when you have these types of confounding issues? And so I actually think there, there's a lot of work out there that we can leverage into game design spaces that make a lot of sense. Um, but I do think as a general rule where we're going to see games in this positivist mode is when we're interested in doing theory testing, um, but traditional observation isn't available, right? Again, the classic example of this is we don't have that many nuclear wars to look at. If we're interested in thinking about um, how different aspects of, say, a, a new weapon system might impact outcomes, we don't have a historical case record to go look for. And so um, this, is, this is where games become 
if not, a, they're not an ideal, you know, they're not sort of the perfect optimal way of generating information, but they're the best available and they fill an important need. And so while we still want to be modest about the extent to which we still have fundamental uncertainties because of um, the potential for artificialities and confounding, um, that's not to say games can't generate credible information that progresses our knowledge in these areas. You know, so I think really you do see um, positivist design in policy spaces, though I do think it's a minority. Um, you know, I think often where we tend to see it is cases where we do have sort of a, a, a clear option one, option two that we're interested in testing. Um, so for example, the, the picture here is from a game that Rand ran in the 60s. Um, that was interested in um, weapons portfolios and sort of how they might impact um, the outcome of, of sort of long-term competition with the Soviet Union, where, you know, you had sort of um, clear comparative cases that you were interested in because um, you wanted to have, you know, what happens if I try to buy this sort of portfolio versus that sort of portfolio? The other case where I think we're seeing a real renaissance of positivist design um, is within the academy. Um, so there's been a lot of really excellent work in the last couple of years, particularly related to issues of escalation, um, whether it be um, looking at nuclear weapons, looking at cyber weapons, um, where we don't have that empirical data, but we're interested in questions about how do people um, perceive these systems? How do they understand what their use is? Um, you know, I, I would particularly, Eric Lynn Greenberg has a really excellent piece um, on the effect of man versus unmanned platforms that I think does a nice job of setting up how you might think about this comparativist model. So I'd really, I'd, I'd point you to that one if you want to see a worked example of this. But when we're thinking about the design here, I think really what we're interested in is how do we make sure that the variation that we want to observe is as clear as possible and that we've eliminated other forms of variation whenever we can and that we are able to explain the Im potential impacts of variation that we're not able to control. Some particular examples of this, right? Um, I think these are games that often we don't progress the scenario all that much because we want to be able to have a credible sort of uh, storyline about what happened without introducing too many other kind of second order effects into the picture. You know, we have a lot of concern about um, bringing in participants that are in some way comparable with one another. And so I think we spend a lot of time thinking about, um, you know, how are participants similar and different from each other? What types of experience and background um, characteristics might they have that we think are important for the phenomenon we're studying? Um, and then finally, with the, game rules, I think we're often sort of struggling with, you know, inevitably when you run a game, you find small things that you want to fix. Um, but then how do you match that with being able to make sure that you're being as consistent as possible between runs? This is something that experimental protocols have to deal with all the time, right? That, that you realize halfway through your experiment that there was a better way to do it. Do you restart over and have to regenerate a bunch of the data you already did? Or do you just accept that you're running sort of you've learned that there was a better way to run it and you'll do it that way next time. Pros and cons both ways, but I think there's a lot we can learn from that experimental literature. All right, so I've walked through um, those, those three philosophies. My guess is that um, I think for most of us, there's one or, or maybe two of them that really kind of resonate most easily. Often that has to do with um, our sort of, our, our methodological training we've had in other contexts. Certainly within the American Academy, a lot of us are trained as empiricists. And so we really like this positivist way of thinking because it's the way we've been trained to think. And so um, when we then move into a space like gaming where the majority of folks are not working in that positivist model, I think there can be a little bit of a, a, a sort of friction between that. And so what, what I would sort of urge everyone to do is to look at which of these modes is sort of the most comfortable for you to think in, but also to seriously consider that these other ways of thinking are valid try to do the exercise of, um, in, you know, thinking through those other logics and thinking in those other logics. Um, not only just because I think that's sort of a useful exercise for making us more flexible game designers, also because, um, you know, often right now we uh, falsely apply um, standards from one field to another, right? we are positivists and we think every game should be run in a positivist manner when that's not what's going on. Or we're this and say games can never be experimental, even though there are ways to run um, games that are experimental that do take seriously the types of artificialities and um, sort of variation um, that have been traditional concerns. 
But I think in order to do that, we have to be much better as designers about being explicit about our logic to make sure that we're, we're able to really help um, folks walk through the process and understand where they're coming from. And so I think that really takes us back to where I started about sort of the pitfalls, right? So I think using these sort of processes helps our frame our games in clearer ways, helps us be um, more honest when we're doing our design process, and then when we're communicating out the game results, helps us sort of trace the dots um, and follow the logic so that not only have we kept ourselves honest, um, but it's easier for other people who are reading our games to understand what claims we're making and why they're credible. All right, with that, let's, let's take questions. Well, Ellie, thank you very much. Uh, for your presentation and we have uh, we've had a a lot of discussion in in the chat uh, while you were speaking and I'd encourage people to uh, please post any questions that you have in the Q&A. Um, I will take questions from the Q&A and and post those to to Ellie. <clears throat> so we have two questions about what uh, TTXs and command post exercises. Um, can you situate those within your framework? Yeah, you, uh, within the initial triangle, right? Um, rather than throw it back up, I'm just going to draw it with my hands, right? So we had workshops up here. I think TTXs tend to be the games that occupy that space that's sort of the, the shaded line between workshops into games. Um, so sometimes when we say a, a tabletop exercise, what we really mean is that it's a workshop. We're, we're not actually driving all the way into forcing players to make a clear decision and then see the consequences of that decision. Um, then I think they tend to, you know, in my world, they would sit on the workshop side of the line. Um, if they are actually a point where you are pushing participants to make a decision and then see some level of consequences, even if it's just, you know, the participants as a group talking about what those consequences might be, I think you're on the gaming side of the line. I think the reason we like using TTX so much is because it sits right in that liminal space. And so when we have a project that that is sort of has characteristics of both, um, TTX is a nice term that lets us lets us straddle the line. I think command post exercises are very much kind of the same thing sitting um, on that bottom corner, right, where um, you know, if you're if you're doing command post exercise where everybody is sitting at their terminal walking through on their actual systems, hey, here's how we would be responding to this sort of thing. I think that falls on the exercise side of the line. If you are removing them and talking them through sort of more in a rock drill kind of way, I think that can start to slide more to the gaming side of the line. But again, I think, you know, that, that's, that is why I think about these as being kind of more spectrums than they are hard and fast lines. Um, you know, I, for the last corner, I did mention human in the loop simulations, but I think are kind of the equivalently liminal activity on the modeling and simulation side. So we have two questions related to hypothesis testing. Um, so do games um, serve as a means to test hypotheses and the other one is on A-B testing? Um, so can you, can you talk a bit more about that and, and what are the requirements for, for, for using games in, in that manner? Yeah, so I think here what's really important is that we say testing to what standard, right? I, I think there is, a, has, we've developed a reflexive discomfort in gaming about saying, oh, games don't test, games don't test. Um, and I don't actually think that that's, that's really right. We're not using games just to generate hypotheses. We are using them to produce um, some initial cut um, kind of, of tests about, is this a plausible idea? Is this a reasonable hypothesis to push forward? And that, that is a form of testing. I think what's important though is that we not go, we recognize that we can, when we're talking about hypothesis testing, right, a hypothesis isn't true or false, right? We are more or less confident in a hypothesis over time. And so games add to or diminish our confidence in a particular hypothesis, um, but that's different than proving. And so, on one hand, I, I believe very firmly that we shouldn't be talking about games as a mechanism for proving anything, um, but that doesn't mean that they don't for, so serve a role in testing. And so um, the way I talk about this um, for, from the more positivist framework, right, we want to be a bit more Bayesian in how we're thinking about this, right? We want to think about updating ourselves and say, hey, our hypothesis is an initial cut, 
we're going to get a better answer based on the evidence that we're seeing and we're going to continue to improve it and we're continue to improve our confidence that we're right about it um rather than treating it as a black line and white line um, that were either not tested or tested um I think I, I think right it's comparative so really what we're saying is be compared you know on a particular sense so I think it's important to be clear about what a what you're better on and be what context we're drawing from. If we're in that service mode, we might be more comfortable generalizing through within sort of a if we're in that critical list, it's much more on um, from one content into All right. So there's there's a follow up question to that. I mean, do you think this kind of testing is um, impossible because games are just too expensive, bespoke, or complex, or do you think there are new ways and tools for wargaming that might allow for a big data approach uh, if you're finding patterns across um, different games? Yeah, so I, I think the first thing I would say is that um, the sort of uh, conception that you need a big data kind of approach, that you need lots and lots of bytes of the apple, is really a, a pretty fundamentally positive this view, right? Um, if you're in critical realism kind of framework, um, what you're actually interested in is having the sort of richness of context to be able to see um, as much of the kind of surrounding evidence as possible. Um, and so that's a very different way of thinking about what the value of information is. And so um, I, I, I kind of want to push, or at least flag, right, that when we talk about testing as requiring lots of, of iterations, we're assuming a positivist model, and that doesn't have to be. Um, so I think we can think about testing in these other frameworks in other ways. Um, I think then the question becomes, you know, what's the additional credibility that's, you know, if we are going to be in a positivist model, what's the additional credibility we get from each additional iteration of the game? Um, and there's a number of ways to think about that. I think the common default is to go into sort of a, a statistical mode, right, where we assume we know the underlying distribution, we're assuming that we're iterating a game a certain number of times and that the central limit theorem will, will handle our problems. It's not actually clear to me that most of the phenomena we're talking about, we necessarily understand any of that. And so I think thinking a little bit more carefully about what the value of iteration actually is and what we're gaining from each additional um, insight is something um, that's actually a, a current line of research that I'm working on is thinking about um, what are those sort of comparisons in other disciplines. So for example, we can think about interviews where we do think there's a value to doing more, but it's very different than the way we think about kind of the statistical value of doing more, um, or case studies where it's a totally different logic yet again. And so I think being a little bit more eclectic in rather than just assuming kind of that big data mindset um, might actually make more sense with games because I think the data that comes out of games is more equivalent to things like interviews or case studies where we are generating um, rich data rather than these sort of singular data points. All of that said, there are efforts that are working more in that big data mode. Um, so the Project on Nuclear Gaming um, at Berkeley has their project Signal that's been run hundreds of times and is working with sort of much larger than traditional iterations. And so there is work going on that way. So we, we have a number of questions on, on choice in war game design. Um, you know, there's there's too much choice when designing and implementing games. Um, so, and, and that creates different trade-offs. So how do, you, how do you decide? How do you connect um, research purpose to game design? Yeah, so I, I hope that part of what these logics are giving you is some indication about what might be a good choice versus a bad choice, right? So, um, 
let's stick with the positivist one just for a moment because we were just talking about it, right? So um, when you're designing a positivist game, um, if you do think it's important that you run it a lot of times because you're interested in some sort of statistical notion of validity, very, you know, whether, whether you should do that or not, different question, but let's, let's say that is, that's the logic you want to use. Um, that argues for a couple of things. You're going to have to run this game a lot. So it should probably be real simple, right? Because if it takes a long time to play, it's going to be hard to generate enough data. Um, you probably want to be fairly uh, constrained in terms of what you allow players to do because you want to have comparable choices. And so if you're going to convert your game data into um, sort of relatively, you know, they made one of several options, you want to keep that list pretty finite or you're going to have real problems processing your data on the back end. Um, you might think that there's value in having the scenario be more abstract because uh, you want to have it put in front of a broad range of people and you don't want to be worrying about what uh, information they might be bringing in because they happen to be experts on Russia. So we're going to call the country country orange and we're going to give it sort of abstract characteristics that don't link one to one with any particular country so that I don't have those sorts of baggage, right? So it allows you a, a sort of thought process when you're making those decisions to rub up against the, that sort of infinite set of choices that you have available to you. Um, at the same time, I don't, what I don't want to suggest is any of these logics are cookie cutters, right? They still leave a lot of space for choice. And I think in general, that is a good thing, right? The, why games are, are so powerful and so rich is because you can, can assemble them in so many ways. And so I really worry that um, if, we, if we treat it as sort of, hey, or, hey this is a, a sort of menu of choices that you can only make these couple of choices, you really miss a lot of the richness. But instead, I think what we should be doing is talking through, hey, what's the logic? How well does the choice I'm making line up against it? Because the reality is games are things that have to happen in the real world and there's always logistical considerations that come into play that limit some of the choices you might have ideally made. Um, and so that's gonna make some of your choices for you too. And I think we need to be honest about that and, and treat that as, as sort of part of the process. Um, so I think that's probably an unsatisfying answer to your question. Um, but, but the answer is, I think it, I hope this helps guide some of those decisions and choices and tells you which ones are better and worse. But at the end of the day, you know, that's why they pay us the big bucks is because we do have to make those choices. So can you talk also a little bit more about the, the time and resource implications for each of these schools of thought? So we have a question that says, you know, to design positive games, more time and resources may be, may be needed compared to those designed for analysis or critical realism um, perspectives. Um, do you see resource implications bearing on, on that choice as well? So the, it's a really interesting question. Um, I do think the repetition is probably the point that's sort of easiest to do the through line on. Um, and so this is something, obviously, I'm still working through in my own head. I do think there is something to the fact that in general, positivism is going to want more repetitions to be credible. And so that will tend to drive up your costs and your level of effort. At the same time, though, I think there's also something about this that, that is, um, there are ways that we're more comfortable thinking and less comfortable thinking thinking and that are, are deeply personal, right? As I said, I think some of it has to do with how we're trained, but I, you know, it's like any other philosophy. There are philosophical ways of thinking that are more comfortable to most of us than others. And I think when we're trying to design against kind of our preferred philosophy, that will always take kind of more effort on our parts because we're thinking in a different way than we usually do. Um, and so I don't necessarily know that that comes with a huge resource bill, but I do think it comes with an additional mental and, and effort load. And so maybe a little bit more time um, spent as a designer kind of thinking it through. Um, you know, I think the best designers are people who can really flexibly move between these modes of thinking. Um, but, I, but I know for myself, right? I, there, are, there are ways of thinking that are more comfortable for me and I will settle back into them if I'm not interrogating my own thought process. Um, and so I think that we're, that that does tend to sort of be the easy road for us and as a general rule. Thank you. Um, and so we have we have a question about um, whether the three isms can be combined 
in in a game so can you can you um are these categories mutually exclusive or do you see uh, is it possible to have a game um that can exist within they can find and extract evidence in using different paradigms at the same time I'm really uncomfortable to say it can do it at the same time. Um, I think there's a fascinating experiment to be done having a game that was designed by somebody, by a team that sort of comfortably fit into each of the paradigms and see whether you could do that. Um, I, I worry that the types, the standards of evidence that what you are pushing for are different enough that I think you are likely to find yourself misunderstanding each other and, and sort of misapplying what you're doing um, to just take the two extremes, right? If you, if the same game is being asked, you know, what is useful as the standard versus what is true as the standard, I feel like that, that, that is going to cause a dissonance that's going to be unhelpful. Now, what I will say, um, not at the same time, but in sequence, definitely, right? So if you look at most mainstream research, I think what you tend to see is a cycling between these different modes of thinking. So I think often, right, if we go back to that sort of uh, classroom version of science we talked about, we generate a hypothesis and then we test a hypothesis, right? So that sort of implies that we start in a critical realist mode and then switch into a more positivist mode. And I think that that's, that's pretty common, um, whether that be that we're using games in different ways in sequence with one another or that we're using games coupled up with other approaches. So I think the most common is we use games to generate hypotheses and then we use other types of tools to test them. But it doesn't have to work that way, right? Um, there are other ways to combine them um, into, into sort of holistic programs of research. And so while I'm skeptical about doing all three at the same time, I definitely think if we broaden the aperture to be about a research program um, or a, you know campaign of inquiry or whatever we're calling it this week when we do when we actually have sort of research agendas, um, I think that that sort of pushes you into a space where thinking in more than one mode is really productive. So we have a question that basically asked why you ignored Patrick Jackson's fourth quadrant. <laughs> <laughs> so right, did um, you plant this question? Is I did not. You've been it, on my case? It, it is from a, a King's first year PhD student. <laughs> um, so the question is, um, you know, concerns the role of subjective experience in scientific logics. The way you juxtapose science as an art made it sound like values are antithetical to rigid and sound scientific reasoning. The Jackson text, which is indeed excellent, I did not plant this, uh, speaks <laughs> about the art, the part of the fourth philosophy, the interpretivism. Um, so um, you can you can take a look at the full question, but but um, why why is that missing? <laughs> uh, it's an excellent question, um, and and it's one that Ivanka has been asking me for the last two years, which is why I'm teasing her about it. Um, so. I think some of this is my own positionality, which is an ironic reason to leave out reflexivity, right? So um, I'm writing this from the position of somebody who mostly works with policymakers. Policymakers do not like thinking in reflexive modes. Um, so part of it is I scoped it out because I think within the sort of games for policy research space, it's an uncomfortable fit to produce credible information um, because it's not a mode of thinking that has a lot of credibility with policymakers. It's not to say it shouldn't or it can't, it's just saying, you know, pragmatically scoping conditions need to apply somewhere and that was one I imposed. Um, you know, so it's, admitting that I, I sort of scoped it out for that reason, I, I think that when you get into reflexive spaces, it becomes very difficult to tease apart when the game is um, about sort of education and communication versus when it's for research. And so I think this is a place where the research, where the divide that I introduced earlier between research and education games may start to erode a little bit, um, which is not a good reason to leave it out. It's a reason that somebody should write the, re the paper that explains why I'm wrong and need to put it back in the typology. So hopefully that will be you. Well, so we have, we have a, we're adding to the research agenda at King, so so thank you for that question. Um, so there, there's um, another another 
question. For oh, you. actually, I'm sorry. Can I yeah. just add one more point on that? Yeah, um, just to the student who asked that question. Um, if you have not been tracking um, Sawyer Judge's work on games as a form of artistic research, I've, it sounds like this might be absolutely up your alley. Um, I think she's doing really important work that is treating games as an art and saying how can that be helpful within within research frames. It sounds like that you guys might be sort of fellow kindred. So I just want to <laughs> a highlight her really excellent work, but also um, point you to her. So we have another question on situating gaming within other disciplines like futures methods, forecasting, other forms of strategic analysis. Um, how does that, uh, can you situate gaming within those disciplines and, and how does that fit within your framework? Yeah, so if we go back to, the, to the, the triangle drawing again for a moment, I think we can generally start to bucket um, anticipatory foresight, forecasting, whatever we're calling it this week, um, kinds of tools into those buckets. So in general, my experience is that they tend to sit either in the expert elicitation workshop kind of frames. Um, here we might think about tools like uh, backcasting um, or Delphi method, um, or you can think about them as being modeling tools, right? Um, you know, we're thinking about uh, things like, uh, you know, at RAND, we have something called robust decision making. It's sort of interested in understanding really wide swaths of scenario space um, that are formally defined. And so I, I think in general, we see that same sort of um, kind of relationship where games definitely do fit into that suite of tools. Um, there are, are games that are explicitly used for these types of um, forecasting kinds of, of techniques. Um, but then there's also lots of things that look and feel a lot like games and sit somewhere in that kind of liminal space we were describing. Um, and so I, I think it's a kind of natural part of that toolkit. So once you've decided on your scientific logic, how do you ensure that your policymakers, uh, your game sponsors with non-academic backgrounds understand the assumptions of that chosen logic and are able to make sensible decisions based on it? Yeah, so I mean, part of what I was trying to do with this work is try to give some of that, that vocabulary. I'm not sure how successful I've been, but um, I, you know, I hope that transitioning to things like you know, don't say abduction, talk about the, you know, the way we talk about evidence in a jury trial, that's like, that's a more accessible way of talking about those sorts of ideas. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, policymakers are probably not going to want to engage in, with you on an hour long discussion of philosophy of science, much as you'll get the occasional one that does, but not usually. Um, so, I, you know, I think making it clear sort of what the so what is for them and putting it into more applied terminology can be helpful. I don't know that I've cracked the code on that. And so I think there's certainly work to be done, um, not just sort of improving what I've done, but also, right, we've got a pretty wide range of sponsors across the gaming community. And my guess is that different parts of that are going to respond differently, right? In my own experience, when I have a sponsor who is trained as an engineer or a hard scientist, I assume they're going to uh, engage with information in a very different way than when I have a sponsor who is uh, you know a political scientist who's been sort of running around um, you know policy circles for a long time, and so I think making sure that we've got a diverse repository of language that we can go to um, that that grounds back to these sort of more intellectual concepts, but but probably is not arguing for introducing epistemology as the term that we're going to be using in those those stakeholder discussions. So we we also have a question on whether this applies to games, not just in the government defense sectors and in academia, but also in, in the corporate sector. Yeah, so here I'm really speaking outside of my own experience. Um, I have not done much games um, for, for corporate work. And so I just want to flag that. My sense from what I do know is that games within the corporate sector are very often actually much more about tools for communication rather than actually being tools for sort of that, and that research. Um, so, so my sense is, is that probably what I'm saying is a little less applicable. Um, but again, I'm talking outside of my own lane here. So if there are folks um, who have that kind of experience and they want to pipe up in the chat, um, I definitely think this is a, a place for more research to be done. So we're, we're a lot of us are, are now moving toward distributed gaming uh, using digital 
um, media. Do you think some of the parad paradigms that you talked about are better or worse suited for distributed gaming? Yeah, it's a really interesting question and one I've been grappling with a lot as I have to move my own gaming practice online. Um, I, I think my answer is mixed, right? I think we all know that communication, when we're, we're communicating over these types of virtual medium, there's friction introduced. And so it's harder to communicate complex ideas between groups of stakeholders. I think that does make analyticists work a little bit harder to do because uh, it just imposes more barriers than when we're in a positivist mode where we've really necked our focus down to a couple of key factors of interest. We've structured the communication we need to do a bit more. And so it come, the friction matters a little bit less. And so my general sense is, is that, you know, sort of analyticists are the hardest, critical realists somewhere in the middle, positivists a little bit easier to, to make work in the digital environment. But I also think there's a lot we just don't know about, like what the, what the potential suite of tools going forward is. I think what I've seen is right now, we're all working within a pretty confined suite of tools because we're sticking to things that are commercial off the shelf because they're stable and reliable. Um, over time, I think we're, you know, if we continue to have to work this way, I think there's going to be more investments made in new platforms and that might change the calculus on some of this. Um, so, you know, I think that's a bit of a to be determined. So we just have a few minutes left and we should end on uh, the topic of ontology. <laughs> so the, your, your scientific um, framework for epistemology presumes an ontology. Um, what are those ontological assumptions? <laughs> uh, my short answer is I did not touch ontology. I did not go that far down the rabbit hole. Um, you know, I, I think it's an interesting question and one that bears more research, but it's not one I've thought about enough that I feel comfortable wading into that water. So I hope whoever asked the question will will continue to ask it and we'll do more work in that vein. Oh, and an, another, another question added to the, the fundamental research agenda at, at King's. So th thank you for that. Um, so do you think that game sponsors, based on your experience, are aware of the different frameworks for, for, game, for these games that you've, you've outlined? Um, you know, I, I don't, if they are aware of them, I think they're aware of them kind of intuitively. Um, and I think that's because we haven't been talking in these, these terminologies, right? We haven't been making these distinctions, um, particularly to the sponsor community, right? And when we, ha and I think to date, we've given pretty mixed messages. Uh, you know, the, the exchange I mentioned a few times in War on the Rocks last fall was really excellent. But I think one thing it highlights is that, you know, you can get some of the leading lights in the field together and they do not agree on some of these fundamental um, sort of playing field terms. And so I think there's, there's some work for all of us to do um, kind of com deciding on how we, we think this works. Um, and presenting it in a consistent way to sponsors that needs to be that needs to be done before we can really have an expectation that we can walk into a sponsor's room and have them be familiar with this. I think right now it's really on us as game designers to do that educational work when we're when we're working with um, either a new person or working with someone in a mode that we haven't worked with them before. Because um, I don't think we can reasonably assume that they've got they've got that framework because I don't think we do. <laughs> Well, Ellie, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, a pleasure to have you back at King's, even, even though virtually. Um, mm -hmm. We still had some questions left. Unfortunately, we've, we're, we're out of time. Um, for those of you who are interested in pursuing fundamental research on wargaming, please get in touch as we develop our, our program here at King's. Uh, for those of you who have further questions for Ellie, please get in touch with, with her via email. Her, your contact information is, is available on, online, is that right? It is, and it was on the title slide. So once the presentation's posted, if you have any trouble finding it, it'll, it'll be there as well. Perfect, thank you. And I would just like to um, extend thanks to Anna Nettleship, who is our coordinator and has been um, directing this behind the scenes, as well as James Smith, who's um, been enabling the, the, the digital, streaming. Um, 
and thank you all for joining us and stay tuned for, for the next event. <laughs>